I don't know if I've ever really expressed this, but I quite enjoy the tactical RPG genre. Even when I'm not particularly good at the game, I still find them fun to play. This might have something to do with me growing up around people who played Final Fantasy Tactics and Vandal Hearts. To be honest, I've kind of been on the hunt for a great tactical RPG for the PlayStation 2. Which brings us to Desgaea. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not 100% certain. Anywho, I came across this game not too long ago after graduating from high school. I was at Last Stop and the game's cover stood out to me. So I picked it up and looked at the back of the case and the words strategy RPG really caught my attention. Right then and there, I bought the game and spent many hours playing it, while also looking up some info on the series. To my surprise, the series has quite the cult following. Now that I've played the game, is it something that I would recommend? Is Desgaea Hour of Darkness worth playing? I apologize for mispronouncing this developer team's name, but I'm not very familiar with Nippon Ichi Software. I say this because it seems these developers not only will develop similar style games, but also seem to have created their own fictional universe. Desgaea appears to take place in that universe. How important it is to this universe, I don't know because I haven't played any of the other series. I've only played the Disgaea game so far. Just thought I should lay that out there. Moving on, the game starts off by setting up the basics to its universe. There are three worlds, Celestia, the world of angels, the human world, and the netherworld, home of the demons. It's in the netherworld where our story begins, by starting with the death of King Karcheskoy, who was the overlord of the netherworld. Months passed and his son did not rise to take his place. Because of this, many other powerful demons started to battle one another for the title of overlord. Two years pass and we find a small female demon named Edna who has been trying to wake up King Krachaskoy's son, Prince Laharl. Upon finally waking up, he scalds Edna for disturbing his nap. Without much hesitation, Edna informs Laharl about what has happened since he was asleep. Laharl is quite surprised by the news, both because he only planned to nap for a few days, but also because he's quite annoyed with the fact that he wasn't woken up earlier so he could claim his rightful title of Overlord. With full determination, Laharl, Edna, and her squad of Prinnies head out to fight other demons and grow their army to conquer the Netherworld. However, at the same time, and Celeste an angel named Lamington summons forth Flan, an angel trainee. He gives Flan a mission, and that mission is to assassinate King Kerchescoy. Surprised by this order, she agrees and goes to the Netherworld. Unsurprisingly, she gets caught by Laharl while she is sneaking around in his castle. Not really caring too much, Laharl informs Flan that his dad is already dead, and that her mission was useless. Flan starts to feel sad about Laharl's dad being dead. Yeah, she's a... Uh... Not very smart. And she is very surprised to see that Laharl doesn't care and is actually glad. They have a slight argument where Laharl says demons don't love others, while Flan thinks they can learn to love. From that moment on, Flan decides to follow Laharl to see if demons really can learn to love. Keep in mind, all this happens in only like the first two episodes. After that, it becomes quite the series of misadventures, as Laharl pursues his goal and Flan learns more about the demon world. And honestly, it's pretty freaking fun. Despite being a very over-the-top world, the story remains pretty focused and not too hard to follow. Plus, all these little adventures the characters go on are very entertaining. Not only because the story has some pretty nice self-aware sense of humor, but there are moments when you get to learn more about the demon world and how it works, or even more about these characters. I was genuinely surprised to see some of these characters getting nice character development, particularly Laharl and Edna. Now with Edna, most of that development is rather hidden. You see, in the castle you can find a hidden switch behind the throne and on the skull. That will open a door in this room right here where you can find her room. In her room, you'll be able to read her diary, which will fill up as you play through the game. She's a really fun character who enjoys being devious and likes every bit of being a demon and can be quite the smartass as well. But by reading her diary, you also get to learn more about how she thinks and what her history is with the Harl's family. And it just makes me love her character more, as I won't spoil for you here. But trust me, reading her diary is a great way to get to know more about her character. However, she is only one of two great characters in this game. 
The second is our main man, Laharl. At first, Laharl comes off as a bratty kid who loves being a demon and wants nothing more than being as evil as he can and trying to become the overlord, which, thanks to the tone and the writing, is actually pretty fun. But, as the game goes on, you get to see another side of him and learn more about his past. There are moments when he becomes surprisingly empathetic and actually has a really good character arc that just won me over. Episode 8 is by far one of my favorite moments with Laharl, and is just just a great moment in the story overall. Flan is, to me, the weakest of the main characters. She's pretty naive, wants to always do what is right, and tries to find the good in everyone. These are all great traits, but at times, she can be rather annoying, and these traits can be taken to extreme levels. I'm sorry, but I tend to enjoy and like my villains more, especially if the good guys are a bit too wholly good. I don't hate her at all, because she still is pretty likable, and does help Laharl grow, and she does have some phony moments too. As for side characters, well, there's quite a few of them, and there is something to enjoy and like about all of them as well. To only name a few, we have an entertaining demon who gets called Midboss, an over-the-top superhero type spaceman named Gordon, and his ever-so-smart and sweet sidekick Jennifer, and even a group of warriors that are a parody to Power Rangers. And of course, there are plenty of lovable monsters you'll get to meet throughout the journey as well. All in all, I really enjoyed this game's story and characters as it was very entertaining and funny, as well as having some nice character moments on the occasion as well as exploring the charming world of the netherworld. Alright, so what is the gameplay like of Disgaea? Well, like I mentioned before, it's a tactical RPG that is broken up into episodes. The episodes are basically chapters, and these consist of maps you have to beat in order to progress through the game. That's not to say it's a linear game. Before and after each battle, Laharl will be at his castle, where you can prepare yourself for future battles. At the castle, you can go to two shops, one that sells you weapons, and the other that will sell you armor and items. What's weird is that if you can't find the equipment you're looking for, you can exit the shop menu and just talk to the shopkeeper again, and they'll have different equipment. Which, hey, is at least kinda useful. Then we have a healer who will heal, cure, and revive units for you. Yeah, this is kind of an annoying feature if you used to games like Final Fantasy Tactics, Fire Emblem, and Eternal Poison. Your characters don't recover between battles, you always have to heal them. This will cost you hell, which is the game's currency. To be fair, it usually won't cost you too much, and if you use the healer enough times, you can get special items to help your characters out, or to sell just to make some extra money. Now, get ready for a slightly confusing feature in the game. That would be the item world. What you do is you select an item for your inventory that your party will be traveling through, kinda. You will then have to go through at least 10 stages before you can exit the item world. Now, thankfully, you don't have to kill every enemy on each stage. You just have to reach these special portals with at least one character. So what is the point of the item world anyway? By going through the item world, the item you select will increase in stats, which is great for weapons and armor. There are even these special moments where you can save residents who will give your item special effects. I've heard some people say that the item world is a good place to grind, but I never really saw where they were coming from. It's true that the level of enemies will be determined by the level of the item, but it takes so much fucking time just to get through the first 10 levels. I like the idea of the feature, but God, I find it to be so tedious, especially if you plan on increasing the stats of more than 5 items. Lastly, we have the Dark Assembly, which is another feature you're going to have to get used to using, and quite often too. You will first select one of your characters to use for the Dark Assembly. From here, they can create new characters, delete other characters, do promotion exams, and make proposals. Most of these actions will cost mana, which is something your character can earn by killing enemies. When you make a new character, you will pretty much have to choose between human units or monster units. The big difference between these units is that humans can equip different kinds of weapons and learn weapon skills, while monsters can only equip monster weapons but will be able to learn special skills as they level up. Different human units will be skilled with certain weapons, like warriors are more skilled with swords and martial artists are more skilled with fists. The more skilled a character is with a weapon, the faster their weapon skill will level up. Once their weapon level has reached a certain level, they will learn 
learn new weapon skills, which can also be leveled up to become more powerful. All weapons, with the exception of staffs, have their own skills which help add some variety to your units, like how axes are great for dealing plenty of damage to single units, spears can learn skills to damage multiple surrounding enemies, and bows will learn skills to inflict status ailments. If you're wondering, staffs are best used for increasing a mage's range for their spells. Mages are the only human units that will learn personal skills, these being magical spells for attacking or healing like clerics. You will unlock a new variety of these units by leveling up other units. To me though, the best varieties are the mages, since you can get some very powerful new spellcasters that way. For example, if you get a red, blue, and green mage to level 5, each, you will unlock the Star Mage. You can also unlock all new units by leveling up different characters at certain levels, like archers, thieves, and ninjas. Though, my personal favorite is the Samurai, which requires a female warrior and fighter to total over level 20 to unlock. I'll explain why I like the Samurai so much later. Because of this variety, people tend to choose human units over monster units, but I still find monster units to be rather fun, since they still get some cool skills, and there are some awesome monsters to choose from. Plus, later monster units will become immune to status ailments. Unfortunately, you can only use enemy units that you fought, as that's how they're unlocked in the game. Now, back to the Dark Assembly. Promotions. Promotions are these challenges your characters will have to do in order to make new proposals. These challenges are fights, so make sure your character is strong enough to take it on alone. Quick side note here, be sure to save as often as you can, which you have to do manually in the menu screen. Now, let's talk about these proposals. These will either aid your character or just help you out in general. We have promotions that will increase your character's counter, movement, or triple EXP that they will earn only after killing one enemy, so it fucking sucks. Other proposals will add new equipment for you to buy at stores, allow you to buy more expensive equipment, unlock harder optional levels, and even increase the level of your enemies. That last one sounds a bit odd, but it's actually kind of useful as grinding is quite tedious, but there are some stages where you can earn some more EXP than usual, so raising the level of the monsters on these stages can really help out in the grinding section. Plus, you can always lower levels back to normal when you're done grinding. And to be honest, it's my preferred way to grind. Right, now, back to proposals. How exactly do these work? Well, basically, your character is taken to a courtroom where some judges will decide whether or not they will pass your proposal. You can see which way the judges are leaning and can even bribe some of them to side with you if you have items they want. If your proposal doesn't pass, you can choose to fight the judges, but they're usually like level 1000 and up, so it's not a very great idea when you first start out. Now that we have some of the character stuff and the Dark Assembly out of the way, why don't we start talking about the actual battles? If you talk to this woman standing in front of this portal, she will take you to whatever map you want to go. So thankfully, you can visit past maps to grind up characters and health, which is something I like. Battles take place on grid-style maps. Instead of selecting characters before fights, you click on this portal thing and choose up to 10 characters you want to come out and fight. Heck, you can even have characters go back to the portal and switch them with different characters. Now, when you choose a character to perform a spell or attack, they won't do it right then and there. Instead, you have to end the turn and then they will attack, or just select them to attack from the menu. This sounds kind of weird, but it does have its advantages in terms of strategy, like having multiple units gang up on one strong enemy. Characters can also team up with each other when attacking an enemy if they're standing next to each other. This happens most often when a unit is next to another character they created. Now this is some pretty standard stuff that I do like, but what makes certain maps challenging are geos. Geos are these small pyramid looking things that will cause different effects on colored panels that they are on. So if an enemy boost geo is on a red panel, then all red panels will give enemies boosts. What makes the these maps so hard is that some have many different kinds of geos. There are geos that will make panels invincible, some will lower defense, others will fucking warp you to random locations after each turn, and then we have cloning geos. These geos will clone all units standing on that color panel, giving you more enemies to kill, and yes, there will even be clones of your own units too. Thankfully, you can destroy geos to remove their effects, and can even change the color of other panels if the geo is destroyed on a different color panel it's on. 
doing things like destroying geos and killing enemies will fill up your bonus gauge, which will give you bonus rewards after winning the fight the more you fill it up. Another interesting technique is lifting. Humans can lift units while monsters can't, and trust me, you will need to lift certain characters on maps in order to get rid of those awful geos. Make sure you don't have a character still lifting another before ending your turn as that will damage your characters. Also, if you throw an enemy at another enemy, it will actually create a stronger enemy, so keep that in mind. Aside from all that, it's a pretty standard tactical RPG that lets you create your own units and grow your party in whatever way you want, as well as unlocking special characters as you play through the game. At the last map of each episode, you'll have to fight a boss character in the map, and these can be pretty tough. By the way, this game has such a charming art style. It's quite cartoon-like with some great looking and well-detailed backgrounds and character portraits during certain scenes. Stages and castles also look pretty great, and there's some nice variety to the themes of these maps as well. Though because of the grid-based design, they can feel pretty similar, but there are some nice colors and details to these maps. The best part for me is the character sprites, as they have some nicely detailed designs to them, and very fluid animation making them a joy to look at. Music is also really good with great mixtures of upbeat joyful tunes and the occasional softer emotional theme. Not only is there great music, but there is also some pretty memorable tracks as well, like the opening theme and the castle theme. Voice acting isn't too bad either. It's certainly not great at certain points, and some actors are worse than others. But for the most part, Laharl and Etna sound Sound pretty good. So why don't I give you some tips? First, grinding. When it comes to grinding, I give one character that I'm working on the best weapons and armor and have them fight alone on the map that they can handle, or raise the level of enemies when I find a map that works best for me. You see, the problem I have with leveling up in this game is that you only get experience for killing enemies rather than performing actions. So healing units become difficult to level up and grinding in of itself is rather a chore. There is this thing where you can reset your character in the Dark Assembly, and some of these stat growths will transfer on over as well, but I never really found this to be very useful. Maybe I just wasn't using it correctly, and that's very plausible, and I wouldn't mind if other players gave me some advice on how they play, but for me, I found this to be an unnecessary feature. Then we have my favorite unit, the Samurai, who I named Aquos. What I like about the Samurai is that they are really good with spears, which is a pretty good weapon. Plus, your weapon skill will increase pretty decently. All you have to do is attack with a weapon for the weapon skill to go up. If you get the Samurai's Spear skill up to 25 or higher, then first go to the Dark Assembly, then just exit and talk to the Spear in Laharl's Castle, and you'll get Longinus, which is the second strongest spear in the game. So yeah, needless to say, this makes any character who wields it pretty fucking useful, and an absolute godsend. If you go talk to Goss in the last episode, you can get a pretty great sword. In the last episode, you can also get the Testament, which is a really great item that raises a character's stats. However, you can only get this item if you've been reading a chapter out of Etna's diary each episode. Should you find yourself needing more hell later on in the game, then go to the Stellar Graveyard and choose the Crosspoint map. Here, you will find wraiths with some items on them. Throw a couple of the wraiths into your portal and your party members will kill them. Beat the map and you'll have them in your party, where you can then remove Remove these items from them and sell them for some decent hell. After you beat the game, you can start from the beginning but with all your characters at their current level and with the same equipment. However, you will lose all the characters you unlock throughout the journey and will have to level them up all over again. If you want to avoid spoilers, I would highly recommend clicking to the time shown as we will be talking about the game's ending. Okay, so let's get this out of the way first. There are multiple endings to this game, kind of. Some, like Etna's ending, are joke endings that require weird objectives to actually see. More likely than not, you're gonna end up with the normal ending which involves Laharl and his friends attacking Celestia once they find out that Volcanus, an evil angel, was behind the plot of having Earth invade the Netherworld. While in Celestia, Flan ends up attacking an angel as they make their way to Lamington. Because Flan attacked an angel, she is punished by being turned into a flower, essentially being dead. Angered by this, Laharl fights Lamington. In the normal ending, Laharl will have killed Lamington, but will sacrifice his own life to revive Flan. In the good ending, which is ridiculously hard to get, Laharl will attempt to sacrifice himself only to be stopped by mid-boss, who reveals that Lamington was testing Laharl's heart. He then revives Flan as a fallen angel, and reveals that he wanted to find some common ground between Celestia and the Netherworld. 
In neither ending, Laharl still goes through his arc, which I like. He started off as a brat who only cared about himself, but in the end learns to care for others, willing to give up his own life so that Flan can have hers. This kind of arc is why I like Laharl so much, as he actually grows. It's an ending that really works for me, and I think it concludes the story rather well. So, would I recommend Disgaea Hour of Darkness? Yes but only if you're able to tolerate the tediousness of the game when it comes to grinding your party. I know I've been harping on this, but two-thirds of my playthrough was spent grinding, and I wouldn't have even say that it was the most efficient grinding either. If they just would have changed gaining experience by performing actions rather than kills, then it wouldn't have been nearly as tedious for me. But if you're willing to put up with all that shit, you'll find a really enjoyable tactical RPG. I love the sense of freedom you get by creating your own party, and all kinds of different units to choose from, and even some cool monsters as well. While the geos can be very annoying, they are a great way to make some of these maps more interesting and challenging. Plus, there are a few secret optional places to go to, though some of these places will require your characters to be over level 1000. Yeah, the level cap is 9999. It's pretty ridiculous. But the greatest part of this game is the story, as it takes you on a pretty fun adventure that gets a bit crazy, but the netherworld is a cool and entertaining place and there are plenty of characters to love, with some even having some nice character arcs. The art style is great too, I love the sprite work in this game. The game most certainly has its flaws, but I still really enjoyed what I played. I can very easily see why this game has a cult following and how it started up a series, and I'm looking forward to playing the sequel. Should you want to play this game, there is also a DS remake. I don't know if it improved the grinding, but a handheld version certainly isn't a bad idea. If the gameplay doesn't interest you, but you're still curious about the characters, well there is an anime of the game, which is okay, I guess. It at the very least hit the right points in how these characters act, mostly, and I do like the episode that is about my favorite episode in the game. I just prefer the game story more. Well, I'll see you all in the sequel to see if they've improved or built upon the gameplay.